Hi, Professor Keating, and welcome to Beyond Belief. It is a great pleasure to meet you, and uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. That's a great honor to meet you too, Rabbi. Thank you for hosting me. My pleasure. So I've um, been thinking a lot about cosmology this week, and um, I have a bunch of questions to ask you. Um, and I'm just very curious to hear, you know, I, I was uh, very excited to, to read this book, which I recommend to our whole audience, um, Losing the Nobel Prize, in which you do a fabulous job, I think, you know, explaining the, the history of, um, of modern cosmology and the back and forth and um, the, the winners and the losers. And you also couch it in, in these terms um, surrounding the Nobel Prize and its mystique and, you know, and, and how it affects people. So I have questions about all of that, but I figured I'd open up like this. And I, I have a feeling you've been asked this kind of question before, but bear with me for one second. Okay. I did a little research. So according to an organization called the International Food Policy Research Institute, for $7 billion, that's the minimum cost of reducing global undernutrition. So then I also discovered that CERN, you know, which uh, is an incredible atom smasher, you know, dozens of kilometers long, wants to spend another $23 billion on a new collider. So my question for you, and this is for the, us lay people who, you know, who, who don't know as much about it as you do, is given the choice between, you know, feeding people for three years, you know, worldwide, or building a new super collider, which one wins out and why? Well, I think it's a false dichotomy to present it <laughs> as if we can cut from scientific expenditures and either cause a net benefit in a targeted specific area or B that, you know, there's somehow fungibility between these uh, these these quantities that you're talking about. Look, they're both astronomical, no pun intended. But the fact is that we have proof even within the realm of physics itself when uh, a cut was made to what was called the superconducting super collider in 1993. I was a beginning graduate student at Brown University. I hadn't picked what I was going to do for my PhD, and I was kind of wandering the halls of of uh, the Barris and Holiday building there on, on Hope Street, and, and I came upon the floor which they house the particle physicists. These are the folks that study the realm of the subatomic, the nucleus, the 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 quarks, and so forth. And they were the most depressed people you've ever seen in your life. It, it looked like a fast day up there, Rabbi. It was, it was, it was so depressing. And the reason was because they had decided that it was over budget and they needed to cut this, um, uh, this, this, you know, phenomenal waste of money uh, called the superconducting super collider, and it would probably not have any major benefits anyway. Lo and behold, you know, 20 years later, Nobel Prize awarded uh, for the discovery of the Higgs boson, many other phenomena. But the argument was made, well, we cut this massive expenditure, which back then was, I think it was going to, it was about $2 billion. So you see the type of inflation that's occurred over just 30 years. But they said, oh, well, you know, this will allow us to spend more on astronomy and cosmology and, and what's called condensed matter or solid state physics. And it'll redound to the benefit of physics and science. It, it didn't do a single thing. There was no direct fungibility, even within physics. So Cole Vahomer or all the more so, as you would say, um, there's no chance that cutting, you know, an expenditure from outside or inside of physics will redound to the benefit of some massive and worthwhile uh, endeavor is ending hunger. I mean, we spend trillions of dollars uh, in the past decade, you know, on cancer research. Um, you know, have we cured cancer? No. Uh, does that mean we can't spend on other diseases and uh, ending hunger, and which is a bigger priority? Um, of course, you can always say that you know the budgets for these things are are really off the charts, but. But then it's always relative to something else. And in this case, we need only look at, say, the NASA budget. The NASA budget is only twice the budget of the Los Angeles Unified School District. Mm -hmm. It's about the same as what people spend on lipstick every year just in America. It's $20 billion or so. So, you know, these are large amounts by by any, you know, normal human being's uh, conception. But I think there's a mistake to think that Cutting here is going to benefit there. Okay, that makes sense. Let me reframe it slightly. Outside of 
you know, and I'm I'm asking this question as someone who is absolutely fascinated with the origins of the universe um, and and particle physics, and um, and I. I thoroughly appreciate, you know, the import of some of the discoveries, but outside of simply knowing more about the uh, the early universe, you know, and the way that the universe operates, wh what would you say are the practical benefits to humanity about knowing more about those things? Or are well, I'll be a little I'll be a little cheeky and I'll say none, and that shouldn't matter one bit. Uh, what are the practical benefits of studying? Uh, you know, the, uh, the decomposition into multidimensional coordinate systems of higher dimensional mathematical spaces that exist in 10 or more dimensions. It has zero relevance, can do nothing for us. So I'll stipulate that. It does not produce technology. And I think there's a problem, you know, that people conflate partially because of their own ignorance about science, but partially because of the incapacity of my fellow colleagues, and I'm sure t to me ex as well, to some extent, of our abject inability to communicate the true revolutionary excitement and awesomeness of pure scientific research, not applied, not practical without any benefit. And it's a problem because we are given the greatest script known to humanity, this story of science, which is a story of truth and practical magic, magic that's real. And we can invoke as Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, you don't get technology without basic fundamental research. We only have the ability to talk on this amazing platform, which is unfathomable even five years ago that we would be able to do this. Yes. It's just sort of propitious that it came about during the time of COVID-19. But this is enabled by breakthroughs in quantum mechanics, communication technology, all which had their origin, their genesis, in blue sky or impractical research. So the, the point of doing research is that is not to only come up with technology and that's the realm of engineering and that's a great thing to do, uh -huh. the practical application of it. But to say that we should abandon, you know, pure science is like looking at a baby and saying, what good is it? It can't do anything for me. Mm -hmm. So the problem is that sometimes pure science produces technology and then people in the lay realm become inured to the fact that they came about from pure scientific research without any goal of application whatsoever. Uh -huh. And to stifle that would be like stifling a baby uh, long before you have a chance to see what it could become. Very thorough and very good answer, I would say, and hopefully it satisfies a lot of uh, people out there who might have had that question. But let's get into, um, let's get into the science for, uh, for a moment. And when I ask you these questions, I'm speaking as a layperson, a, a layperson who has, like I said, a great interest in, in these matters for my own purposes. But um, there's something called the standard model in cosmology. Um, a lot of people at this point are familiar with the concept of the Big Bang. Um, they have a certain idea of, of what it means, you know, that there was some kind of massive explosion 13.8 billion years ago. Um, and the universe has been expanding at some rate ever since. Okay. Um, in your book, you outline sort of the ping pong back and forth between different models and, you know, how we sort of came out to believe that the standard model is, is the one. But recently, um, it seems like that's come under fire. I've, I've heard from philosophers um, and from scientists, physicists, um, that we're not so sure anymore. Um, what is the state of play uh, of the standard model, and and what are the implications? You know, if it's if it's on the outs. Yeah. So the so-called standard model typically refers to not a cosmological paradigm, but really to the elementary particle physics, the realm of the you know, protons, neutrons, subatomic particles, quarks, et cetera. So typically we call that the standard model. You are correct that the Big Bang Theory is not just you know an ultra popular hit TV show, but it is the dominating model of uh, the early origin, early evolution of the universe. Uh, unfortunately, in most people's minds, it becomes sort of um, conflated with the origin of time and, or even the origin of the universe, which may 
require by necessity the origin of time. We can get into that later. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a mistake. It's a mistake to think that cosmology is concerned with the actual origin of the universe, the the instantiation, the beginning itself, or time equals zero, any more than biology is concerned with the origin of life itself, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was a failing, you know, uh, freshman in, in, in college, and, and we had to uh, dissect a frog in biology class, you know, um, I was really bad at it. I mean, sometimes the frog would live. I mean, this is this is not a good biologist. You don't want me operating on you. Um, but when you do this thing, you don't say, hmm, let me start with the uh, with the synthesis of of inorganic compounds into organic compounds. No, you don't. You are so far advanced beyond that. And it happens to be that the that what we do as professional cosmologists is not only perhaps excluded from observing the actual origin of the universe itself, but what's called an event horizon that may be possible, that may be true. Uh, we don't know, and that's part of my research is to endeavor to find if there was an actual beginning, a singularity, mm -hmm. which would then perforce have a, an event horizon shielding its origin from our view. That is an open question, and that is how I butter the bread in this household. <laughs> but on the other hand, um, we we can't expect it to to necessarily be the case that we have to understand how the universe came into be to understand how it's evolved. Now, putting that aside, once you stipulate that there is a universe, which you know some people actually, and believe it or not, deny, uh, but that there is a reality, there is a universe, there are objects in the universe, we can then ask questions about the observations that we make with telescopes today, noting the fact that light travels a finite distance in a finite time that makes telescopes into effectively time machines. And that allows us by looking out at great distances to view objects at earlier and earlier times. And all the evidence that we have, there's not a single reputable cosmologist who does not believe that in the distant past, 13.8 billion years ago, there was an extremely different environment that pervaded throughout the observable universe. Uh -huh. And this was one that was incredibly hot, incredibly dense, as the Big Bang theme song um, connotes. So we all agree on that. Now, the question is, you know, if you take out, you know, I just, uh, to my wife's dismay, decided I would make this like breakfast souffle this morning. And I, I made it with eggs and I whipped up the eggs and, and I put some other stuff in it. and. And then I cooked it and it started to expand. And I, I used the wrong temperature, Rabbi. This is embarrassing. I, the, a recipe called for 300 and I was lazy. I put on 350, but I figured, oh, I'll just cook it for shorter. You know, I'm a brilliant scientist, as you can tell. Uh, oh, and so I came back in and it was almost about to be burned. And this thing had expanded. It was like bigger than my ego. This thing had puffed up so much, okay? When I looked at it, I said, hmm, this is interesting. Depending on the temperature and the time, the product of those two things, it determined how much it expanded. So all the more so, you could run that movie backwards and you can infer that it was denser. In this case, it was colder, but that's that's irrelevant. Um, and so you can look at the expansion of something and infer in the past, as long as the underlying base level of reality hasn't changed, in other words, the speed of light hasn't changed, the electrical constants haven't changed, that the universe was extremely hot, extremely dense, and it was essentially a nuclear fusion reactor. And the question is, what came before that? Uh -huh. And as the Talmud quotes, as you know, in Hagiga, uh, page 11, Ahmed Bayes, it says, you may speculate what came in the early days, but what became before that you may not speculate. Now, my job is to actually, you know, violate what Rabbi Akiva and those guys were talking about back then and really ask the question is, what happened before there was a nuclear fusion reactor? Yeah. What happened before the universe was this enormous, you know, uh, violent reactive place? Was it even more violent or was it perhaps indicative and, and, and conclusive of a pre-existing cosmos? And these are the most exciting questions I can think to answer with the limited amount of time, energy, and attention that I have to devote to them. I agree. <clears throat> and those are our, um, concepts that have uh, potential ramifications and, and implications for the nature of reality. Um, and and as such, I think there are there are quite a few people who are you know very interested to know those answers. And you know. Um, to answer our earlier question, maybe that's reason enough. It's just to satisfy this this primal human desire to know our origins, um, you know, to do this kind of research. But one of the models 
talks about an, an infinite universe. Another one talks about one that oscillates, meaning you know, explosion, contraction, back and forth. And I've read various things, you know, trying to understand what those mean. Here's, here's a question. So when I consider the possibility of the universe being truly infinite, and you'll correct me, I'm sure, if I'm wrong, but I would think it would have reached a state of maximum entropy since it's been around for an eternal period of time um, and would just be absolutely lifeless, cold, and, you know, and expanded beyond imagination. Um, doesn't the simple fact of, of the state of entropy that we're in now imply that there had to have been a, a beginning and that we can't be living in an eternal universe? Yeah, so uh, people, as I said, we're not uh, really concerned with with the notion of what came before. We'll get into that later as as an explanation of how things came to be right now, any more than we can claim to know that there was a singularity, a beginning of time. But what uh, I think what you're talk talking about is the notion that the universe could be infinite in size. Uh, we know it's not the observable universe, that is, the maximum radial distance from which today we can receive information, whatever that is in the form of neutrinos, uh, protons, neutrons, croutons, my favorite uh, particle, uh, or light. That is what the definition of the observable universe is. It's a very large volume. It corresponds to something much large, three times larger than the age of the universe times the speed of light. That would naively give you about 13.8 billion light years. It turns out that that the radius is more like 45 billion light years for technical reasons, uh, but it doesn't change the nature of the refutation of, of the claim that the universe is infinite. It's not infinite in time. Therefore, it can't, because it's not traveling, you know, as we can understand things are not moving faster than the speed of light locally, then the universe is a finite universe. It may be embedded in a greater, uh, more barren emptier space that it is sort of expanding into in a way that I will have to, you know, refer you to uh, a little bit higher mathematics than I cover in my book. But the point is, we don't believe the universe is infinitely old. So it hasn't had enough time to get to this point of sterility, barrenness, and awful solitude that you describe, rightfully so. Now, there are theories that say that it will not only get to that point of awful sterility, but it will get so in a finite amount of time, not an infinite amount of time. Uh, the human mind has difficulties with infinity. It's, it's funny, computers can do almost every math problem better than any human being, but they really can't process what it means to be infinite. Wow. We can deal with infinities, but we can't visualize them. We have trouble manipulating them. Uh, we have trouble, we take something that's infinite and multiply it by something that's zero, and it brings up all sorts of paradoxes and conundra. So, I would say, um, first of all, no, the universe is not infinite in size as far as we can tell, uh, but it may be. We just can only access information over a finite volume. And in that volume, the universe is highly entropic. It is highly disordered. And the second law of thermodynamics being what it is, an inviolable law of physics, as inviolable as the Ten Commandments are to you, this this behavior of the universe is inexorably proceeding from lower entropy to higher entropy. So all we can say is that the universe was very low entropy in its earlier state. And how the universe got to that very early low entropy state is, of course, the notion, the, the, the basis for the research that I do. Um, and it may be it was instantiated by an omnipotent being. It may be that we have to stipulate that it began with as low entropy as possible. Uh, but this caused a lot of problems for people, which perforce caused them to reject the notion of a singularity in the early universe's beginning. And therefore, to come up with a reason and a mechanism to explain a low entropy condition that doesn't require a singularity. Okay, but that's a logical possibility that there could be one. Right. Okay, good. So, so then in... In summation, it seems like uh, it's still in flux. We don't we don't have ultimate answers just yet. We we can only say that, as I say, that the universe was extremely unlike what it is today. Right. That it was extremely hot, extremely dense, uh, and there are pos there are many possibilities, but two of the most popular ones are that there was a singularity, mm -hmm. in which case there was an origin in a certain sense. 
that begs the question of where that how that origin uh, gets started. How do you, how does the clock start ticking when no time exists before its creation? Right. Um, and then there's another notion in parallel and a very controversial one in some sense and and very much opposed by other people in the. A for in the uh, in the in the former camp, and that's that the universe had a pre-existing cosmos from which it formed. Right, and those models are kind of resurging, and it's interesting to see these these battles. But look, you may get come away, or your audience may be coming away with the impression we don't know what the hell we're talking about. We're just kind of like, you know, arguing about angels on the head of a pin, and and this is all nonsense. No, a hundred years ago, the greatest you know scientist arguably who ever lived. Uh, was was uh, Albert Einstein, and you know he had his own uh, you know theological ramifications and b uh, belief systems, but um, one thing he held on to for sure was that the universe was static, mm -hmm. and it was eternally old, and so we know we've ruled that out, uh, uh, you know, with conclusive evidence. There's nobody who believes the universe is purely static, and they haven't for 50 years or more, but. There are those that claim uh, in two different camps. The universe had a beginning or it's a, kind of a part of a single cycle or perhaps an infinite number of cycles. Well, and so both have their problems and both have their uh, attractors. Okay, we'll, we're all going to stay tuned. And, uh, and I hope you come up with the answer um, soon, actually. We'll see. Um, okay, I will. Um, let me ask you about a concept uh, called the uh, axis of evil in, in cosmology, from which I, I understand that it's like um, the location of Earth is supposed to be very unimportant, very random, right? And for reasons I, I will not claim to fully understand, that this axis of evil seems to imply a greater significance um, than, it, than we would expect. And I saw this quote from Lawrence Krauss, which says, the new results are either telling us that all of science is wrong and we're we're the center of the universe, or maybe the data is simply incorrect, or maybe it's telling us that there's something weird about the microwave background results and that maybe, maybe there's something wrong with our theories on larger scales. Well, what can you tell us about this concept? And what well, so Lawrence is a friend of mine. I've had him on my podcast. He's had me on his podcast. Uh, I like to call him out, uh, uh, use him as a punching bag for a variety of different uh, purposes, including his uh, utter lack of knowledge of his birth religions, uh, main tenets and, and other things. Uh, but we have a friendly kind of debate about that. Uh, I would say that this this is a little bit overblown. It's traces, as you said, it's not that the Earth's place is, is sort of you know, unimportant. The Earth it would be very surprising to find the earth in a very different location than where it is, right? I mean, that we're on the earth, that we're around a star in a, of a certain type of star that's not too violent, that's not too cold, it's not too hot. We're in this Goldilocks zone. Right. Um, that's, that's to be expected. That we're in a galaxy, the galaxy could be interchangeable. We could move everything, transport it three uh, million light years away to Andromeda, and we probably wouldn't notice a difference. Uh, there's really almost nothing about the galactic environment. And that be, that portrays what's called the cosmological principle, which is a generalization of what's called the Copernican principle, mm -hmm. which was sort of this, this ultimate statement that the Earth is not special, our place in the universe is not special. Back then, Copernicus was arguing that the sun is the center of the cosmos in contradistinction to Aristotle and thousands of years of history before him and took Galileo and others to, to finally prove that we weren't at the center of the solar, that we weren't the center of the solar system. And then the debate shifted to, well, the sun could be at the center of the galaxy. And then the galaxy could be the center of the universe. And then the universe now we're talking about, well, where are we in the multiverse if there is such a concept? So the axis of evil uh, suggests that there is a particular direction when you look in it, that there are phenomena that aren't aren't invariant, that aren't symmetric, with respect to where you're looking throughout the rest of the cosmos. So that the the Copernican principle applied to the universe as a whole should mean that no matter where you look, which direction you look, the universe should be isotropic. Now, obviously, it's not on scales of you know your room or the solar system even or even our galaxy, but on scales of thousands and millions of galaxies, it is obeyed. Um, and there is a slight deviation in one form of light, the light that I study called the cosmic microwave background radiation. 
And that seems to indicate a, di a direction that is an axis of broken symmetry. And that may be significant. And fortunately, with tools like the Simons Observatory and other projects uh, that my colleagues and I work on, we will be able to glean more information and see if it's it's actually honest to goodnessly truly there, or if it's a statistical fluctuation, which happens more than most scientists want to recognize. Mm -hmm. And this has become part of what's called the replication crisis and other branches of science. But we have our own problems because we can't do dissections of thousands of frogs, you know, throughout history. We only have one universe. We only have one planet where we know there's life. So it's very difficult to do statistically significant sample sizes. Uh, on a topic that only has a sample size of one. So that makes it more challenging, but I wouldn't uh, start betting on truly violation of this principle just yet. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Interesting. Um, I got two more science questions for you, and then I'll get into a little bit of a, um, a character ethics kind of question. Um, so here's something that's been bothering me for forever and you're the exact right guy to, to explain it to me. Um, you know, we, we learn about the concept of space and time getting curved, you know, by mass, gravity. Um, and the thing that I've never been able to wrap my head around is what is the thing that's getting curved? What is the thing that's getting curved? Um, so I think that is, uh, it, it is um, kind of a, a challenge for the human being to imagine what is curved without making use of some analogy, which by nature will have its limitations. And those limitations are due to the fact that we exist and have evolved in a, a world of three spatial dimensions and one time dimension. Mm -hmm. We talk about curvature. We have to make an analogy. We have to either restrict the number of uh, space and time dimensions or freeze time and just look at fixed spatial uh, sections. So we typically will do that by envisioning the four-dimensional world that we live in as some three-dimensional shape. And there's th only three different possibilities for a three-dimensional shape. Uh -huh. One is flat, and you can think about a three-dimensional set of monkey bars extending in all directions to infinity. And okay. you could also think about those, those monkey bars now, uh, but imagine they're warped like a Pringle chip or like a saddle. Some, somehow they're displaced in some way. So the three-dimensional relationship is different. The lengths are different. The angles between different ob uh, objects and their isotropic or anisotropic properties are different. And then there's a third possibility. They could be spherically curved, mm -hmm. okay? It could be like a, a ball uh, on which the trajectories of objects, including people, rockets, and beams of light, can only travel along those curved sections. So we say that the uh, universe is curved. What we mean is that all three of these different geometries have different and the curvature values. So one is called positive curvature, that's a sphere. One is called negative curvature, that's a Pringles chip or a saddle. And one is called flat, and that has zero curvature. So when we look at these curvature um, pro possibilities, we can ask, well, how can we measure if we live in a universe that's curved? And it's exactly like measuring that the Earth was curved. So you could you could go out and sail around the universe, and sail around the Earth, and see if you come back to where you were. Well, that could take a while. Or you could do what they used to do, and they used to put, uh, they used to do it with with shadows of of light at different locations, and the projection of the shadow on different locations separated by some known distance in, in feet or miles, that would be indicative. The angle that the shadow cast would be different at different locations, implying, unlike the flat Earth theory, that the universe that the Earth was curved. And so you can imagine uh, extending this out. You can say, imagine you live on a flat uh, a piece of paper. You make a triangle between three points. You pick any three points. Hopefully, they're pretty far apart, so you can actually truly test this in an accurate way. So imagine you pick three points on, on, on the Earth. You can pick Boston. Uh, you can pick San Diego. And you can pick uh, Seattle. There's That forms a triangle on the surface of the Earth. If you go out and make the measurement of the angles of each of those three angles, and then you add them up, they will be slightly greater than 180 degrees. And that will prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt 
that you live on a positively curved spherical surface. Mm -hmm. And that's the surface of the earth. Now, it won't be perfectly spherical. We can get into all the deviations, but it'd be very different than if we lived on a Pringle chip or if we lived on a flat surface. Mm -hmm. And so each of those can be defined. Now, how do we know the universe is not curved? It means that we go out, we take three stars, we start with our, and not, you know, we're not waiting for Shabbos to be over. <laughs> right. We take the, we take, actually, so. we, all, we only need two stars. So <laughs> you go out, you set the earth as one of your points, your vertices on your triangle, and you measure two really distant stars, and you measure the angles between those two stars and the earth. And it comes out that that's 180 degrees. Mm. Great. That's awesome. Now you go out and say, well, maybe that's just like when I measure the, you know, three points in San Diego, I'll get 180 degrees, even though I live on the surface of the of a curved Earth. That's because the Earth is uh, is curved with a large radius of curvature compared to the size of San Diego or Boston or wherever. So now let me go out to galaxies. Well, it turns out if I do the exact same thing, pick the Milky Way galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, and the Triangulum galaxy, and put those together, make a triangle. No, nope, same thing, 180 degrees when you sum up the angles of the triangle. Do that for any objects, the most distant quasars in the universe and even the CMB, and it has the exact same phenomena. So we know the universe is flat. So it, it saves us some mental headaches. So I don't even teach, starting teaching next week, I, I don't even teach that it could be that we live in a curved universe because it's so improbable. Of course, we don't know exactly. Nothing in science is known with 100% certainty. Um, even that statement is not known with 100% certainty. Uh, but nevertheless, we have no need to teach about that any more than we teach that the Earth could be could be flat in geography class. So, so that I understand that the that the dimensions of the universe could be these different shapes, so to speak, right? And you use different analogies like paper and the and the earth. And I understand what paper and the earth are, so on and so forth, right? But there there is this concept that if if this is a, a giant mass out in space, that that there will be curvature around around it because it affects the way that the that space is. Yeah. Am I right about that? Yes, locally space can be curved. That's true. Oh, okay, so what I still don't understand what is being curved. I understand that within space, there are stars and quasars and dust, which you talk a lot about in your book, and, and many other things. But right, but in between all that stuff is a vacuum, as far as I know. So, so okay, so, so what is the thing that's getting curved if it's not those things that already exist in the universe? What, what curves? So imagine, well, look at the Earth, okay? So if you look at the Earth, there could be, in fact, there are, you know, craters on the Earth, which are roughly uh, Pringle-shaped depressions. There are mountains that look like mounds uh, on the Earth, right? There's things, there's buildings that have very different shapes than curvature. And actually, the Earth is not a perfect sphere, uh, but it's much more close to a sphere than it is to being flat. So we always deal with what are called the, the bulk uh, properties of a of a manifold, or, uh, you know, space time is called a manifold. It's a uh, large scale. Obviously, it's, it extends to great distances, and we can measure how far out we can um, see light towards, and that can allow us to construct these things. But absolutely right, there are deviations on local scales, and that's in fact what allowed us to verify Einstein's theory of general relativity in 1919 because of the fact that the sun was eclipsed by the moon. That indicated there were stars behind the moon behind the sun and their light trajectories, the positions of those stars were warped and squished and squashed by the intervening amount of matter, which was the mass of the sun. And depending on the mass of the object that's in the foreground, that's called gravitational lensing. Gravitational lensing is the bending of space-time trajectories of light and deviations of them, and we call those perturbations. So locally there are perturbations, in the curvature of space-time. And that's very fortunate. And that allows things for like orbital mechanics, for planets to orbit around stars, but it also allowed the seeds to form in the early universe for how the universe would accrete structure in certain places rather than others. Because if there were no perturbations, if there was complete symmetry, isotropy, and perfect, perfect cosmological principle, we would not not be here according to the uh, our understanding of structure formation because there'd be no place for a condensation of matter that would later become a star and a galaxy and a planet and so forth to occur. Perfect symmetry is deadly. Perfect symmetry is actually the, the height of entropy. 
So it's it's completely uh, imp improbable for there to be a fluctuation that would then lead to a galaxy that could harbor a star, which could harbor a planet, which could harbor life. You explain this stuff very well. I, I appreciate it. you're very articulate about it. Um, and and by the way, your book is very accessible for a science book. Very, very so accessible. You, because, you know, the, the Talmud says also <laughs> that the easily embarrassed do not learn. So the fact that you can learn means uh, that you don't have a compunction about s seeming to be embarrassed, or, uh, but you should have no fear of being embarrassed because your questions are quite good. Right. You know, normally people ask, you know, they'll say, you know, Brian, uh, uh, Professor Keating, I'd love to ask you, you know, um, you know, how did the universe begin? I have a simple question, you know, <laughs> but uh, I think you're you're far beyond that. And it's important to approach these questions with humility. I mean, as Einstein said, people used to come up to him and like, oh, Professor Einstein, I'd love to learn your theory, but I'm not good in math. And he'd say, you think you're not good in math? Like, I have my own troubles with math. So uh, I, I commend you for that ability that you have. Well, thank you. And I, I wanted to second to last question real fast. I mean, maybe. But um, speaking of humility, right, your, your, your book is focused around the Nobel Prize, right, which it seems produces, could produce humility, but sometimes it seems it produces the opposite of that. And you actually liken it towards the end of the book to the golden calf of biblical fame. And I want to read a quote that you wrote, which I liked very much. You said, they fawned over the gilded medallion. You're talking about people who gathered around to see the prize itself, pushing past one another just to get a glimpse of it. No one actually bowed down to it, but some did kiss it. Some tried to sneak off with it. I'm ashamed to say I was among the worshipers, unable to resist posing for a picture with the medallion. So, you know, we have this, I think, um, mistaken notion that scientists are sort of like Spock, you know, that all you're interested in is, is knowledge and, um, and no, no matter what it is, you'll be happy with it. And you sit in your labs and, and you just do pure thinking, you know, and, and that's it. But I guess your experience is not quite like that. Um, and my, my ultimate question is, at this point, do you think that the Nobel Prize is ultimately good or bad for scientific discovery? Or is it good or bad for scientists? Uh, I'll say yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I do believe it's good or bad. I, I think it's, uh, it's a superposition and there's ambiguity. There are good aspects of it that I try to preserve. Most people think of this first book, my first book as kind of a, a tear down, a takedown, a, you know, trolling the Nobel Prize. There's some of that in it, but it's, it's mostly a memoir, as, as you can, you know, That's uh, verify. You know, it's an autobiography of a scientist as a young man trying to wrestle with uh, personal demons and, and ambition and and wanting to have some, you know, rarefied company to inhabit because of a competition that I had with my, you know, now deceased father. Uh, who is also a great scientist, but never won a Nobel Prize. But we were very competitive. And in fact, he abandoned me. And I, and I talk about that in the book. But the ultimate, you know, accolade, not just in science, but in, uh, and then not just in the five other categories, you know, physics, chemistry, medicine, uh, economics, and peace, um, and literature. So not just in those six categories, but in all of society. I mean, you see this every couple of months, you'll see how many Nobel Prize winners are coming out to, you know, protest the Iran, you know, some treaty or some, you know, war in Ukraine or this and that. Um, you'll hear it every four years, reliably, the 70 Nobel Prize winners will tell you which Democrat you should vote for. Uh, and it's become, you know, almost silly because you'll have you know, Nobel Prize winning physicists who, you know, discovered, you know, some uh, acceleration of the universe. And then they'll be talking about nuclear war treaties with uh, with Iran. It's like they have no subject matter expertise whatsoever. You shouldn't listen to them at all. You shouldn't listen to me about that. Um, and so we have what are called political scientists, you know, scientists that then wade into it. So it's impossible not to, you know, stress the the impact that the Nobel Prize has. Now, that said, I believe its good qualities could be used for reformation in order to reform it, to restore it, to do teshuva, to back what it was when Alfred Nobel wrote it in his Zava'ah, in his ethical will in 1895. And he was interesting. He he adheres to the, to the Talmudic dictum that you should write your will, you know, the day before you die. I mean, he wrote it the year before he died. He's pretty lucky. 
Um, and it said very clearly that he wanted it to redound to the benefit of mankind. And it didn't say anything about, you know, it had to, you know, then be used to, to you know, to advocate for, you know, GMOs or, or you know, some treaty with some kind, you know, it didn't have anything to do with that. Uh, but it was for discoveries or inventions in the preceding year to a single person. And it's gotten very bastardized from that. It's incredibly, uh, you know, deformed and corrupted in many ways to suit the needs of, you know, these 400 mostly male scientists in Sweden. <laughs> Uh, and it's it's incredible to think about how much impact they have on young people's lives and and also on the media and culture. It's incredible. There's 400 people uh, in Sweden, of all places. So uh, it, it really has strayed. And as you know, the, the highest thing you can do, the, one of the greatest mitzvahs you can do is to you know honor the wishes of the dead because they can't repay you. So you're doing it purely selflessly. And I felt that my small way, maybe I could help to, you know, restore the Nobel Prize to what Alfred so nobly, no pun intended, wanted to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so it's a good, it's a blessing and it's a curse. It's a double-edged sword. It has very beneficial uh, prospects that encourage people to do science in, in some ways and, and can produce funding and so forth. But it also brings out jealousy, pettiness, you know, subterfuge and egos, like almost nothing. You almost couldn't design a machine to kind of, you know, potentially undermine the scientific process more efficient than the Nobel Prize. <laughs> that's, that's a big statement. And, uh, and, and I think an important one, you know, as you outline, um, that's why I asked the question is like, ultimately, is it helpful or it's not helpful? And you're saying it's both, which I understand. Um, but people should check out the book and and decide for themselves whether um, whether the Nobel Prize is ultimately a good thing or not. Which and this is the first time I've ever considered that maybe it's not. Um, but last question um, is if you know from your sitting at your vantage point right now, if you if you were a betting man, are you betting on the singularity model uh, or you think it's going to turn out to be something else? Ah, so that's a very dangerous question to ask a scientist. <laughs> um, not not only is it dangerous for any scientist, but especially for an experimentalist, and especially one who's been through this kind of ringer of the perils of what's called confirmation bias. Yes. So when you assume a, to the conclusion that you're going to find something or expect to see something or want to see something, uh, then you're more likely to uh, accept evidence that seems confirmatory and exclude evidence that seems disconf uh, disconfirmatory. Uh, and it's a very perilous thing. Now, I'm a human being. <laughs> you know, I'm not Spock uh, as much as, you know, my wife sometimes might think I am. But the ultimate, you know, goal should be that I, I want to see, I want to do the best experiment possible and not be tricked and deceived into following after what my heart and my eyes lead me to prostitute myself to do, right? Okay. So you have, I have to be very careful about that. And I wasn't, you know, I, I mean, I admit I, I was careless in some ways and, and I let the team, you know, kind of the exuberance of it carry me away. Even when I knew I, would, I wouldn't win a Nobel Prize, even when I was sure that even if we were right, which would turned out to be wrong, but even if we were, I wouldn't win it. I still felt like I wanted it to be true, and I, and and I didn't I didn't I would of course hurt either way to not win the Nobel Prize, but it would hurt less if somebody else on this team on this experiment that I created was sort of my baby, um, had you know been successful because it would have meant we did the right thing and we and we and we achieved this goal that I set 20 years ago, but um, but it's not to say that we did fraudulent. I mean, there are scientists that do this. There's a huge you know, tumult back and forth in places where the stakes are much higher. I mean, you were talking about technology. So this is, there's no technology that can possibly come from knowing if there's a singularity as you're asking me to, you know, wager on. But uh, but just in the last three months, there's been two remarkable breakthroughs in nuclear fusion technology and in claims about the discovery of superconductivity at room temperature. Both of these will revolutionize not just climate change and everything else. They'll revolutionize technology and is multiple trillions of dollars. And both of them have seed capital and investors and Series A and all this stuff behind them. It's incredible. So think about the potential, not just for the Nobel Prize, which would guarantee if these things hold up and are replicated in the case of the superconductor. But these are tremendous breakthroughs with potential to revolutionize technology and, of course, to bring untold remuneration to their discoverers. Mm -hmm. So think about the temptation there. 
it's very distracted. So part of the goal of the book was to give a, a, a Jeremiah to a young scientist wrestling with these ethical issues, perhaps, and and really try to connote the fact that the, the at the end of the day, you're going to be most proud of yourself for doing extremely accurate, extremely precise science. And wherever the chips fall, whether it's singularity or not, um, I'll be I'll, I'll I'll hope I'll be happy. Me too. Dr. Keating, thank you so much for being here today and taking the time. Uh, it was really a pleasure to get to know you for an hour. Um, and, um, and your work is really exciting. And I, I wish you a lot of luck going forward. Um, and for our audience, please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please visit beyondbelief.blog and check out all the amazing stuff we have going on there. And like, comment, and share to help spread the word. Thank you all for being here. Have a great day.